What you're hearing right now is a recording of a musician performing on the oldest playable instrument the world knows of. This 9,000 year old flute was found at an archaeological site in China and was made from the wing bone of a bird. Although it isn't quite as intricate as modern instruments, researchers noticed a very interesting detail in regards to its structure. The instrument has modifications that would only be made with the intent of tuning the instrument so that a full octave can be played on it. This implies that early humans had an understanding of music that was much more in depth than people had thought previously. But why is this the case? Why do we even have the ability to enjoy music in the first place? Let's take a look. Modern neuroscience has shown us that listening to music acts upon the brain in the same way that eating food or building a shelter does. Specifically, it causes the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which the human body primarily uses to incentivize keeping itself alive and passing on its genetic material. Why is it then that this chemical, which is used by the human body to ensure survival, is also released when we listen to our favorite tune? There aren't any imminent threats to our well-being if we stop listening to music, so why would the brain have any reason to care whether we listen to music or don't? Well, research in this area has an explanation which seems contradictory to what many researchers had previously assumed. The question they'd been asking up until recently is how did humans go from using language to then creating and understanding music? But what recent studies in this field have uncovered is that we should be thinking of it the other way around. Stephen J. Mithen, in his book The Singing Neanderthals, The Origins of Music, Language, Mind, and Body, poses a different perspective into this topic. Mithen expands upon the work of Charles Darwin's Descent of Man on this issue. He makes the case that because language is more complex and requires significant effort to fully develop, a more likely scenario to explain early human development is that humans and our ancestors originally communicated through singing. By being able to differentiate between different tones in their usage, early humans could convey emotions and ideas. It follows, then, that these humans would be using singing, or the vocalization of music, to communicate. This communication, referred to as a musical proto-language, would then be an essential part of their lives, as the ability to form relationships, warn of incoming threats, and just helping other humans in general, would be based on being able to express their emotions through music. This means that being able to comprehend and appreciate music would be a skill which helped early humans cooperate, and this cooperation would lead to better survival. This suggests that early humans who could appreciate music more than others would be more likely to survive, and thus pass on the trait. While this may explain why our brains feel rewarded when they hear musical tones in general, it doesn't really clarify why we find certain combinations of sounds pleasurable and call that music, versus why other combinations of sounds are just sounds. Also, if it were this simple, it would mean that there would be a generally consistent response to music between all people, which we know to not be the case. To understand this, we need to go back and take a closer look into the neuroscience of the issue. Valerie Salampour, a neuroscientist at McGill University, along with some of her colleagues, published a study dealing with this exact issue. In this study, they measured brain activity in response to different musical selections. They defined musical frisson, or the feeling of chills you get when you listen to a really great song, as the peak emotional response. Based on the data that they took, using technologies like fMRI and PET scans, they uncovered some very interesting results. They found that the structure of music has direct correlations with situations that the human body is attuned to respond to. Examples such as expectations, delay, tension, resolution, surprise, and anticipation are all things that elicit responses from humans, and they also found these integrated into the structure of music. They found that the areas in music where musical frisson was recorded directly corresponded to the situations being more intense. Their research also showed that the brain, specifically the dorsal striatum, responds to each of these cases where these interactions occur by releasing dopamine, increasing the overall enjoyment of the song. This type of dopamine release is based on the relationships between musical notes, 
rather than the notes themselves, which explains why certain combinations of notes cause an emotional response, while others don't. This then brings up another big question. Why doesn't everyone respond the same way to all music? Well, this is likely a result of the fact that we tend to associate songs with certain memories and experiences we've had. Since everyone has unique sets of experiences, it makes sense that the response of someone to one song or type of music could be positive while another person could have the complete opposite reaction to the same song or genre. While there certainly have been huge strides in understanding music's effect on the brain, research is nowhere near complete in this subject. So the best we can do now is to stay curious and keep inquiring. Hello fellow inquirers, feel free to hit that subscribe button, tap that bell icon, and forcefully attack that like button. It's greatly appreciated. Until next time.